we're coming to uh, the biblical text once again, as we always do every week, to kind of come in and to learn what God has to say to us. God is speaking today, and God speaks today to us through his word. His Holy Spirit takes that word and brings it deep into us. And as we come to this text this morning, we're gonna re- you're going to realize very quickly that John the Baptist has a real place within the Christmas story. Sometimes we only uh, think of him along with Elizabeth and his mother, but really he's got a story or he's got a message for us as we prepare for Jesus, as, as we prefer, prepare for this symbolic coming of Jesus at Christmas time, John is the right person to go to. He is getting us ready for that very important day. So let's move to uh, Matthew chapter 11. We're going to be reading from verse 2 down to verse 11. Matthew 11, verses 2 to 11. When John heard in prison what Christ was doing, he sent his disciples to ask him, Are you the one who was to come, or should we expect someone else? Jesus replied, Go back and report to John what you hear and see. The blind receive sight, the lame walk, those who have leprosy are cured, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the good news is preached to the poor. Blessed is the man who does not fall away on account of me. As John's disciples were leaving, Jesus began to speak to the crowd about John. What did you go out into the desert to see? A reed swayed by the wind? If not, what did you go out to see? A man dressed in fine clothes? No, those who wear fine clothes are in gang's palaces. Then what did you go out to see? A prophet? Yes, I tell you and more than a prophet. This is the one about whom it is written. I will send my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way before you. I tell you the truth. Among those born of women, there has not risen anyone greater than John the Baptist. Yet, he who is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. The word of the Lord read in our midst. Let us pray. Holy God, you have given us a message through your great messenger, the herald, John the Baptist. Lord, we just pray that as we come to hear about his interaction with Jesus today that happened uh, many years ago, Lord, that we would have ears to hear. Lord, what it is that you want to say to us through this message that you are giving back to John. Lord, may it be clear to us how we are supposed to prepare our lives for you coming into our life, and also to respond to the work you've already done in us. Lord, be with us now. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. The Christmas season is known for a bunch of things, right? There's a lot of things that Christmas is known for, but one of the ones that I think all of us would agree that it's known for its food, right? It's known for the food. There are always parties to go to. There's work parties, church parties, friends parties, And of course, the big family gatherings, and there's always, always food. Now, there's crackers and cheese, including new Bothwell cheese, which is my new great temptation, uh, along with fruit trays and vegetable trays, and of course, many types of desserts uh, that range from cookies to those peanut butter and chocolate crunchy things, Ryan, that, you know, it's just, they're great, aren't they? Yeah, they're to die for. But not all sweet things are a temptation. On one corner of that smorgasbord, probably sitting close to the back of the table, is a plate that stays full for most of the party. The children avoid it, and only the desperate will try a piece. It's called Christmas fruitcake. (laughs) Back when I was a kid, fruitcake must have been given out as a gift, because I remember seeing all these wrapped up pieces of fruit bread or fruitcake around the house after Christmas. These little pieces of fruit bread would be passed by in favor of the more edible sweets that were all over the house. Uh, Christmas fruit bread would be forgotten and would sit there for many months until I was desperate one day for some sugar and got up the courage to take a bite. No matter how many times I tried Christmas fruit cake as a child, I never came to enjoy it. But now, fruit cake, well, not something I ever crave, has memories attached to it from when I was a child, and now I actually enjoy it. 
and even look forward to it at Christmas time. As we learned last week, the word fruit in the Bible has a distinct and important place within the language of Advent and Christmas. We learned that John the Baptist spoke about the importance of the fruit of our lives. When he was speaking to the Pharisees and Sadducees, he reminded them that being a child of Abraham was not enough to save them. What we do and say, how we live is the fruit of who we are, and that's what needs to change when we become Christians, when we are followers of God. Who we are is a result of what Jesus has done in us and for us. If we have no fruit, John would tell us, then we have not been changed by Jesus. So this morning, we are once again going to talk about Christmas fruit. Not Christmas fruit that you'd find in a bread or in a cake, but Christmas fruit that is the change in our outward actions that comes as a result of knowing Jesus as Savior. Jesus who came as a little baby more than two centuries ago, right? We're going to discover what the fruit of John's life entitled him, or we're going to discover that the fruit of John's life entitled him to be called great. Jesus calls him great. John, Jesus says, is a great man. In fact, John and Jesus are great by the measure of the fruit they produce. But what you may not know is that you too can be great in the kingdom of God. This morning, we're going to discover how you can be great, how you can be called great in the kingdom of God. Let us begin by looking at Matthew chapter 11, verses 2 and 3. We see that John, John the Baptist, is in prison. Now, he was in prison. Why? Because he was preaching a, a message of repentance, and he challenged the authorities of the day. You know, what happens when you challenge the authorities? When you start saying things they don't want to hear? What do they do? Well, if you work for them, they fire you. But if uh, you're in that case where you're speaking against kings and queens, they put you in prison. Right? If there's authorities in your life, they're going to make your life difficult if you start, if you start challenging them and start uh, making life difficult. So that's what they did, right? They got, uh, they got upset with John and they put him in prison. It's from his cell that he hears about the deeds of Jesus. He hears about what Jesus is doing and he decides to investigate Jesus by asking Jesus to contextualize his deeds for him. John wants to know. If the deeds that Jesus is performing are the deeds of the Messiah, is Jesus the one that they are expecting, or should they be starting to look for somebody else? It's a little shocking, isn't it? Because John is the one who baptized Jesus. He was the one that saw the Spirit come down upon, upon Jesus. So he's wrestling with something that we should be surprised that he's wrestling with. Let's be clear, though, John's not doubting that God is going to send a Messiah. The question John is wrestling with, is Jesus the one that God had sent to do the saving? John, you see, was expecting a little bit more messianic judgment than what he was noticing Jesus teaching and preaching. This is what causes him to misunderstand Jesus' work and to start asking question, questions. Jesus is doing the work of what? What's Jesus doing? He's healing people. He's, uh, he's bringing peace. He's uh, living among sinners. Rather than preaching judgment on sinful living. John, I'm guessing, was interpreting what Jesus was doing through his own message and calling. And what was his message? His message was repent. You know, it was this big, tough message. You know, he's this big, strong, strapping guy out in the desert, you know, uh, you know, calling for people to make changes in their life. And here's Jesus sitting at the tables with sinners. Kind of going, this is not what I was expecting uh, when I was heralding the Messiah. I thought we were going to have radical political change. I thought, you know, Jesus was going to come in and inaugurate a new era of, of maybe Jewish rule. He, he had a different vision of what was going to go on here. And if that was the case, that's how he was looking at Jesus. You can see how through his own particular actions, because his actions were more judgment-oriented, he'd start to wonder if Jesus really was the one that was to come. Then we read in verses 4 to 6, Jesus' reply to John's question and some of the things that make Jesus great. Now, my interpretation of what Jesus is saying to John's disciples is go back and report to John what you hear and see 
that I am doing, tell them about the fruit, uh, kind of the Christmas fruit, uh, of my ministry. Now, John had already heard about what Jesus was doing. He was not unaware of what Jesus was doing, as it says in verse 2. What was different this time is that Jesus sends John's disciples back to him with some important and detailed information and explanation, along with some examples of the sort of things he was doing. The information gives a theological framework. So, right, he's just looking at these actions, and he has no way to contextualize them, to understand them. They're just things that are happening. What Jesus does is he sends back kind of like a box. He says, okay, now these, there's these free-floating actions happening all over the place, and you don't understand or, or what they mean, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to create a framework around it, and I'm going to contextualize it so you can look at it and see it more clearly so that you can understand my deeds, Jesus says. Um, the words of verse 5 list many of the fruit of Jesus' ministry, and they're an echo rather than a direct transcription of what we read in the prophecies about the Messiah in the book of Isaiah. We read in Isaiah chapter 35, verse 5 and 6. Then will the eyes of the blind be opened, the ears of the deaf unstopped. Then will the lame leap like a deer and the mute tongue shout for joy. Water will gush forth in the wilderness and streams in the desert. These miraculous healings that this Messiah is going to do will be the fruit by which Isaiah says you will recognize the Messiah. So Jesus, to make this connection for John, he's going to create a framework. He recounts some of the things that he's doing um, to give proof to show that he is the Messiah. So he talks about um, healing of the blind, right? Matthew chapter 9, verse 29 to 30. Then he touched their eyes and said, according to your faith, will it be done to you? And their sight was restored. So you got to remember, Matthew has, this is Matthew chapter 11. In Matthew chapters 8 and 9 are many of the miracles of Jesus. So this is coming, and now Jesus is referencing back to what's happened in chapters 8 and 9. All these miracles. So again, so he's done a healing. He's done restored sight. Then there's the curing of the lame so they could walk again. Matthew chapter 9, verses 6 to 7. So that you may know the Son of Man has an authority on earth to forgive sins. Then he said to the paralytic, get up, take your mat, and go home. And the man got up and went home. But Jesus isn't only saying, I just fulfill what Isaiah said. But you know what? I've even done more than that. So you know that something new is really starting? He talks about the lepers being cleansed. Lepers are cleansed in Matthew 8, 1 to 4. Jesus reached out his hand and touched the man. I am willing, he said, be clean. And immediately he was cured of leprosy. And then more than that, the dead are raised. Now, Isaiah didn't even see this. So Isaiah thinks this guy is going to be great. He's going to do wonderful things. He's going to heal people. The mute are going to speak. But you know what? Jesus says, even the dead are raised. When Matthew entered the ruler's house and saw the flute players and the noisy crowd, he said, go away. The girl's not dead, but asleep. But they laughed at him. After the crowd had been put outside, he went in and took the girl by the hand, and she got up. Since these things conform to what it says in the scriptures about the Messiah, Jesus is saying to John, look, here is the answer to your question. By the evidence, the fruit, you can know that I'm the Messiah. Jesus' identity should have been clear and obvious then to John. He needed nothing else. Jesus expected the herald of the coming Messiah with evidence now in hand to come to the right conclusion. And in light of that, Jesus in verse 6 offers a beatitude to John. This is really interesting, right? Because we always have the beatitudes and we talk about the beatitudes. But here's a lone one all by itself sitting in Matthew chapter 11. Another beatitude. Blessed is anyone who does not stumble on account of me. He's telling John, if you want blessing, if you want to be great, don't stumble on account of me. The word stumble in the Greek can also be translated tripped up. You know, many people have been put off by Jesus' message. They've been tripped up by it. The establishment, the smart, the powerful, the wealthy often take offense at Jesus because he calls them to something different, to live for others and not just for themselves. They will at times become violently opposed to Jesus because he challenges them to live a different way. We have to be careful that we ourselves are not tripped up in our relationship with Jesus with Jesus by people opposed to Jesus and his message. After all, we don't want to lose out on God's blessing. 
if we don't want to lose out on God's blessing, we don't want to therefore get tripped up by what other people are saying or doing. This is not easy because many of those who oppose the message of Jesus will be in power over us. Just think of the political landscape, guys. You know that being a Christian and, and trying to run in politics is actually in, well, in Canada, is actually a, could be a mark against you rather than a mark for you. In the States, it's a little different. You know, you could be, it could be seen as a good thing, right? So maybe a politician might start saying, well, I'm a Christian, but I'm not going to make a big deal about it. I'm just going to push it down and make it quiet. In a sense, he's getting tripped up by the uh, disregard that other people have for the message of Jesus. And he starts go he's going to lose out on the blessing of being the Christian because he's hiding it because of those who get tripped up by it. In the same way, maybe in your work environment or in, uh, when you're making a sale or something like that, there could be somebody that was violently against Christianity. You shouldn't start hiding your Christianity. You shouldn't start pushing it to the side, making very light of it because of the way others uh, might respond. That is the way Christians get tripped up because how we feel my, people might treat us or think about us when they find out that we're Christians. As a representative or ambassador of the good news, we need to be bound by our relationship with God to live for Him, especially if we want His blessing. Is there anybody here that does not want God's blessing? Because, hey, you know what? If you don't want God's blessing, that's fine. You don't have to have it. Just don't live for Him. Just make sure that you only come to church on Sunday morning and that's the only place you act like a Christian. Every, and then I guarantee you, you won't get his blessings if that's what you're trying to do, if you're trying to hide from them. On the other hand, if you want to be great and you want to receive those blessings, live for him. Live for him. In Jesus' day, there were many Jews who took offense at him because of his anti-establishment message. There were many people who started following after, after him and then walked away because it was going to mean standing publicly against the elite. What, make Jesus, what makes Jesus great beyond his obviously being the son of God? and the Messiah, is that he breaks the worldly ideal of greatness. Instead of achieving greatness by self-centered manipulation from a place of power, he goes to the lowest of society. He does his work there. He does his work amongst the poor, the lepers, the broken. It's so radical what Jesus does that even John needs help to understand what he's doing. Isn't a Messiah supposed to overthrow and judge? Jesus is radically shifting what it means to do the work of God, and it's a radical shift in what our ideas of greatness are. He challenges us to start acting and working like, that, like Him, and to be great like Him. Then in verses 7 to 8, Jesus switches gears and begins to speak about John. At first, He speaks about Himself and the fru fruit He produces. Now it's time to speak about the fruit that John produces that makes him great. But this information isn't for John's disciples or even Jesus' disciples. It's for the crowds. I like that, you know. There's the disciples and they get their special time with him. But sometimes Jesus turns and he points towards the crowds and he says, this is for you. This is for you. So he asked the crowds what they went out to see to John in the wilderness. As we remember from last week, there was probably some buzz in the towns because of the crazy guy, right? There's the crazy guy. He's wearing fur, uh, fur a leather belt, and um, he's eating bugs and honey, and he's standing out in the middle of the field yelling. And so we think he's the crazy guy. Everybody goes out to see him, kind of like a circus sideshow. But that quickly changes. John had turned from a simple curiosity into being a prophet with a powerful message that was drawing large crowds. These crowds began to listen to what John had to say. They confessed their sins. They repented and were baptized. So the crowds who were surrounding Jesus at this time were the crowds that were surrounding John earlier while he was preaching. The same group of people. Jesus then asked the crowds a couple of rhetorical questions that he asked questions that he himself would answer. What did they go out in the wilderness to see? Jesus asks, a reed swayed by the wind? New Testament times, to say that somebody was like a reed, it was like a bulrush. Does any, you guys, some of you guys live on, uh, live on the river and stuff like that. You got that big tall grass, right? And Manitoba is known for a little bit of wind, all right? So to say, uh, you, when you guys go out and look at those reeds and that wind, what happens, right? It just 
starts swaying. It, it moves wherever the wind's going, right? And that's what, that's what uh, Jesus is saying. He's saying, did you go out to see a reed that waves in the wind? In other words, had no moral fiber, no courage, would just follow after whatever the majority said, that's what they would do. Reminds me of kind of a shady politician, right? A shady politician will always want to take a poll because he has no moral ideals of himself. He just wants to stay in power. So whatever the majority say, that's what we're going to do. So more people say that, then we're going to go there. If not, they go over there. That's that kind of, we don't want to be those kind of people, right? I hope that in uh, the way that we do our business and that we, uh, you know, I've talked to a number of you about this. You know, there are times in your business where you're going to be asked to stand up for something that's right, but that isn't going to benefit you. We should not, I hope that people would never say of us that Rose North are, are people like reeds in a wind. They just bow to whatever direction the world is going, or whatever is best for them. Rather, they stand by a principle. And that principle guides them, whether it benefits them or not, because they know what is right, and they follow it. And then if we do that, if we stand strong, we're being like John. We're being like John the Baptist. We're standing for a principle, something that's important, with moral fiber and courage. So did they go out to see that? No. They went out to see a prophet. A prophet who was going to call for radical change. Then in verse 8, we see the next question Jesus asks. He asked the crowd if they went out in the wilderness to see a man dressed in fine clothes. Did they go out to see somebody uh, that uh, dressed really nice? You know, when you look at um, some of the uh, superstar preachers, sometimes you wonder, you know, uh, they obviously have a lot of money for fashion because you see these guys and, uh, you know, they got the Armani suits and, and they're just looking pretty flash and, and, and looking pretty awesome. And uh, we don't go to see, we don't go to see John for that kind of thing. That may draw people today. Uh, the, the, the flash, but it's not what drew people to John. Um, I think people actually, you know, if you're, if you're part of the jet set as a preacher, I think people should probably start questioning uh, what it is you're doing, uh, you know, and the kind of life you're living, maybe even character. When all of a sudden um, you see these uh, pastors that are rolling in millions of dollars and have, you know, the you know, fi- you know, 15,000 square foot home, you start wondering, right? Well, in a sense, Living the way John did, he actually uh, gave power to his message. He, he actually uh, gave credit to his message because of that. John was a prophet. He didn't dress in the trendiest fashions. I'm sure nobody went to see John to get fashion advice. Um, his credibility was not in his cool factor, but in his character and his message. His credi- uh, his, that's where his credibility was. Those who dressed well at that time were people of high stature. They were also people who could not be trusted. They were the kings and queens. Talk about not being able to trust the kings and queens. Where's John right now when he's, uh, Jesus is giving this message? He's in prison. In prison by who? Somebody who dresses really well. Uh, one of those kings. John's way of dressing and living and speaking was not soft but hard, challenging, difficult. And this indicated that he had a different character and message. And it pointed to his greatness. You see, John was a prophet... But Jesus says he was much more than a prophet. Verse, t- uh, verse 10, he quotes Malachi chapter 3, verse 1, which says that God is going to send a messenger ahead of Jesus who is going to prepare the way for Jesus. So the very nature of the message that John is giving is going to be one that makes him different from all the prophets before him. He's going to be the last prophet. We talk about prophets. The last prophet was John. And as he spoke, he was... Um, indicating a change in the way the world worked. Why were prophets needed in the Old Testament? Does anybody know? Why were prophets needed in the Old Testament? Because God didn't speak directly to people. He spoke to special people that were indicated, and then he spoke through them to the people. How does God speak to us today? It's two words. First starts with H. The next one starts with S. What was that? <laughs> Harv Schellenberg, that's right. Oh, man. Okay, I got to keep... <laughs> Chair of leadership, though, you know. Maybe he does. Holy Spirit. <laughs> yeah. One or the other. I'm going to go with Holy Spirit. So, yeah, the Holy Spirit actually does uh, speak to us today. And um, he comes uh, to us and all of us. That's why as a congregationally led church, why we believe in that, so, why it's so important. 
It's so important because as a priesthood of believers, we don't think that God speaks especially through uh, our chair of leadership or the pastor or somebody else, in the, uh, one individual in the church. Rather, we believe that God is speaking to all of us and that it's in the coming together of many voices and the prayer and the offering up of, of ourselves to God's direction that God will speak to us. So we need to be, in some ways, we need to be strong, moral fiber, stand for what's right. But as a church, we also need to be people who are generous with each other and are listening to hear what, how God might speak to, to someone else. And not the powerful. I'll tell you this. M- most often, I think if we get in any type of challenge or difficulty, there are some older ladies in our congregation that we would be very wise to listen to. There are some people, um, some people that might not, have a, uh, might, might not serve on a committee in our church that might be the people we need to listen to. Because sometimes God, God speaks through many people. And it's not, the, it's not the powerful. It's not always the strong that God works through. Sometimes he does. But a lot of times it's through the, the weak. Maybe we even need to lift, listen to our teenagers. Wouldn't that be shocking? Everyone goes, yeah, you know, let's, let's listen to our older people. That's good. But it, could it be the case that God spoke to us through somebody young? Do you think it's true? Do you think he could? I'm not seeing any nodding, so I'm starting to wonder. Yes, good. Okay, big nods. Good. Yes, I, I believe it's true. I think God can speak to us through young people. So we need to be listening to how God is speaking. Uh, God was speaking at that time through John. Before Jesus uh, start his public, uh, was doing his public ministry, and then further before he left his spirit. So I want to turn our attention now to uh, verse 11, which says, Yet whoever is least in the kingdom of heaven. Oh, this is amazing. Whoever is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. You know what? So John, he's just raised, said, John is the greatest man that has ever been born of woman. He is the greatest, the greatest man. And then he says, yeah, but whoever is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than him. Hmm. I think he's talking about, he's talking about two things. He's talking about two different ages, right? So John is the greatest of the past age. Now, because of Christ, he's inaugurating a new age where people are saved and come into a personal relationship with God. And he said, even the least in that kingdom is greater than anybody before that kingdom, not because of anything they've done, but because of the gift of God. That's what happened. Now, there's a second part to that too, right? Greatness in the kingdom of God does not only come through, uh, comes also through our actions and our fruit, the things that we're doing. Looking at John, because the God is working on us, we can accomplish great things. Because the Spirit's working in you, you can do more than even John did. You can accomplish great things through the power of God. Greatness in the kingdom of God does not come through actions or fruit in itself. Rather, greatness is displayed by the fruit, by the actions. Greatness is found in being part of the kingdom of God. Greatness comes from God. It's a gift to us through salvation. But that greatness is manifested through our actions or our fruit. Friends, greatness is something talked about by many people looking to develop a great company, right? You you read that title of that book, uh, Good to Great. That's a a book, a a business book. Um, They want to achieve a better season, right? We're going to have the greatest season ever. Next season, not this season. To getting higher grades. You know, I want to be great at school. It seems in our culture that everybody wants to be great. Unfortunately, their definition of greatness leads down the wrong path. It can lead Christians to pursue power and prestige to the detriment of what's truly important. A relationship with God. Their family, their friends, their church. These things should be above and have a greater standing than our you know, prestige or, or how we're exa- uh, seen by the world. Matthew's account of Jesus and John in chapter 11, verses 2 to 11, gives us a different picture of greatness. Not a picture that's so heavenly minded that it's no earthly good, but a picture of greatness that brings the spiritual world directly in touch with the practical world, with practical action. Jesus, who we know to be great, does not play the political game and work only amongst the elite, but instead chooses to do work amongst the poor and the downtrodden, the sinners and the unclean, the disabled and the forgotten. 
That's our call. That's the group we are supposed to be working with. We should be working that and caring for that in our own community, that is, in our own church, in our larger Rose North community, and even as we go around the world, we're looking to the poor, to the downtrodden, to the people that don't have, from us, that have many things. We need to see who Jesus works with and realize that too, we too will be great when we are not only looking to rub shoulders with the powerful, but also the ones Jesus makes a priority of. John was, as Jesus testifies, a great man. He had the courage to preach a tough message, to stand by his convictions even in the face of condemnation. Yet he balanced this. I love John for this. He balanced this with a humility that submitted to Jesus, even when Jesus was saying and doing things that didn't make much sense to him. Guys, as Christians, this may be one of the most challenging callings we have. You have to be both hard and soft at the same time. That's a hard calling, isn't it? You have to be hard. You have to be tough. You have to be courageous. You have to go out into the world. You have to speak a tough message. You have to lead with courage. And at the same time, you have to be malleable. You have to be able to be shaped by God. If you are so, so strong all the time that you're like concrete, that you're like something like steel, like a rod, you can't be moved, God can't speak to you. If you want God to speak to you, you have to be malleable because guess what? Guess what he's going to tell you? He's going to tell you the things you need to change in your life, the kind of person that you need to become. He's more interested in a sense in your being and he wants that being to change. And so we need to be like kind of like a Play-Doh or something like that in his hands. They can shape us. But we have to be tough at the same time. John was able to do that. This Advent and Christmas season, we're going to see a lot of food. Maybe even the infamous fruitcake will make an appearance. But more important is the fruit of our lives, the actions we perform. Is this Christmas season going to be one uh, where our actions change? Where we start acting in new ways, we start new behaviors, we start living in a way that reflects the salvation that we've received. My hope is that the fruit of your life it will be an indication of the work God has done in you and is doing in you. Because those who bear spiritual fruit of a life changed by Jesus, even if the fruit is really small, will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, you are challenging us to live a new way. You have changed us by the, by the work of your Son, by the power of your Spirit. Lord, we have been changed. We know that uh, by the power of the Spirit, we are sanctified before you. We are cleansed. At the same time, we live in a sinful world. And we ourselves still are tempted and fall into sin. Lord, I just pray that you would help us by the power of your Spirit to start changing the way that we are living, the actions that we take, the words that we speak. Lord, that we may uh, have a Christmas that is one where we're preparing for you to take a greater part in our lives, a greater part in the way that we live. We saw this in Jesus' name. Amen.